Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Stars Daily Sports Podcast. It's Wednesday, January 6th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Today's topic, Bob Davis. The Hall of Fame sports broadcaster who retired in 2016 has a new book called The Dream is Real, My Life on the Airwaves. The book is a collaboration with Jeff Bolig, who has a couple of other KU-centric books to his credit. And the three of us had a great time earlier this week talking about Bob's career and his years with the Jayhawks and Royals. At the end, Jeff tells us how to get a copy of the book. So let's get started with Bob Davis. But first, you'll hear two of his signature calls, both from the same year, 2008. First, Kansas forced overtime in the NCAA basketball final against Memphis when Mario Chalmers buried a three-pointer with two seconds remaining. Then, the following football season, in November, Kansas defeated Missouri at Arrowhead Stadium on a final minute completion from Todd Reesing to Kerry Miner. So, here we go. 71% on the year at the line. Tonight, he's two for two. Both were at the end of three-point plays. He may be a one-and-done guy. Derrick Rose to the free-throw line. For the free-throw, 10.8 to play. It is up. No good. It bounces out. Not over yet. Now Kansas is going to come down the floor, probably play a 1-4. A Mario up top, or actually probably Sharon. Four guys down on the baseline. Drive and pitch. Rose for the second shot. It is. Good. It's a three-point Memphis lead. Hawks need a three-point basket. 10.8. Here they come. Collins. Seven seconds to go in the game. Collins got pushed. Falls down. Chalmers shoots. Oh! Three. The game tied. 2.1. Memphis inbounding. A half-court shot. No good. Unbelievable Overtime. shot. Overtime. Overtime. Wow, how about that shot? That play was almost over when Sharon Collins got bumped, stumbled a little bit. The ball coming off, he's able to get it and come back to Mario. And unbelievably, Memphis doesn't get all the way out on him out there. They got a little bit close to him, but not close enough. And just a huge three over the top. What a comeback. Reaching with the ball. Here comes Frazier. And he's flushed out of the pocket. He throws. Got Meyer. Touchdown! 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 Terry Meyer! Freezing avoided pressure. He stepped up inside the tackle. Started outside. Meanwhile, Terry Meyer carried on his route. Came open late. The gunslinger hit him in stride. Well, I'm, I'm just happy as I can be to be joined by Bob <laughs> Davis and Jeff Bolig who collaborated on the book, The Dream is Real, My Life on the Airwaves, Stories as Told to Jeff Bolig by Bob Davis. I think I got that right in some order. I I think the the words are right, and you can figure out the order, but yeah, uh, that'll that'll play, won't it? I mean, uh, uh, glad to have both of you on, and, and Bob, the... It, 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 it struck me when I saw the cover of the book that uh, The Dream is Real, of course, is, is your call from the championship game of, of 1988. Mm. And it also, as I was uh, going through the book, really enjoyed it. Uh, it struck me that it, it can apply to your life and broadcasting as well. You sort of did leave a dream life, did you not? Well, the alternative was, are you kidding me? <laughs> You did that? No. It's been a great run, great fun, and, you know, associating with people like you and other media types. But, uh, you know, we have sports because it gives us a release, right? And please release me. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's start with the origin. Um, uh, I, I know you've been thinking about doing this, you and Jeff, uh, on the collaboration. How did... Uh, how did he finally talk you into it, or you talk him into it? How did that uh, come I think about? he threatened me. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff's a lot younger and a lot quicker. and So I, he, he'd been wanting to do it, being a, a Hayes boy, or a Hayes boy, as we would say. Uh, he'd followed a lot of this stuff as a fan, and then he came to KU, so he was involved with that. And he just kept saying, you know, we ought to do a book. And, and Jeff had done some books, you know, the Fog Allen book and a couple of others, and uh, he remembered how much fun he had. And he said, I'm going to jump into that mud pile again and see if it's as much fun this time. 
Is that about right, Jeff? Well, I, yeah, it's close. Uh, you know, I had approached Bob several years ago and, it, you know, uh, I think when Bob was working still, he said, no, nah, I don't want to do it. And really, Bob was just being humble. He, he was trying to pass it off. And, and, and Bob is really a, a humble person. And I think that's one thing you find just dealing with him. But I thought uh, he's such a great storyteller. He has such a great sense of humor that I don't think, you know, Blair, the media knows it, who, who interact with Bob and the coaches. But really, the listeners don't get the full view of, of Bob's humor because I think Bob always had too much respect for the game to make it, you know, too slapstick. Right. I think Bob's humor is tremendous. And so the stories uh, just needed to be told. And so finally, um, I think after twisting the arm so much, he said, quit it. It hurts. Let's get this darn thing over with. So we did it. <laughs> and it was out in the, uh, the, 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 the latter half of 2020 out in time for Christmas. Right. And, right. you know, it's, it, um, I was saddened. The timing of it was, first of all, it was great because we got to see it, read it, uh, but you didn't get to go out and promote it in a way that, uh, that, that you maybe would have liked to with, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. I could imagine lines out the door for a book signing. I hope that when there's a, uh, there's a solution to this pandemic, that that'll be part of the, that's part of the plan to get, um, you know, to get you in stores and and in, in shops to, to to get the Bob Davis autograph copy. Of Ooh. Book. Well, well, that is that is the goal. So hopefully, not only in, in the Kansas City, Lawrence, or Topeka area, but maybe Wichita, certainly Hayes as well. That that's the goal. So we're uh, hoping for better weather and uh, and the end of the pandemic. What's a pandemic? <laughs> oh no, we've all learned, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Gosh, who knew? Uh, no, uh, nobody who has lived through it, and uh, it is, uh, it's quite inconvenient, I must say. It's, it's it is a little terrible. inconvenient. Yeah. I like things to be convenient and, and readily ap apparent. Were you here in 84? I was not. When you started at Kansas, I was, um, I was still working in Virginia. I was about five yeah. years away from coming to Kansas City, but um, you, you were among the first people who, who greeted me warmly when I did get here and I was covering KU. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I'm sure everybody who has an, uh, some kind of relationship or connection to Kansas, as I did as a beat writer in, in the 1990s, just picks out favorite parts of the book. And, uh -huh. um, and mine was your recollections of my, your recollection of the, the Glenn Mason, Roy Williams era, just when they got started and, through right. the 90s there were so many so many good times in that time period um glenn mason got the football program up and going and uh, and of course roy williams was just a a smash of a hire from a, a real unknown and uh, and you were there to 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 help usher in both of those eras with um you know in, in your role uh, th that's one of the things that occurred to me as i was reading it bob that you know you get to know the coaches on a, on a, on a level that others do not, right. You, you are, you know, you, you not only host their shows, you travel with the team, you, you know, you're with them on the weekend when, when they go. And so I counted down, by the way, um, you worked with eight football coaches <laughs> during your time at Kansas, not counting the two interim coaches, uh, All right. uh counted three basketball coaches, which I think is uh, pretty incredible. And, and a handful of athletic directors, um, so let's, let's talk about when you got to Kansas in 1984, what were the conditions, the circumstances, um, uh, of, of that? What, uh, uh, you had had some job offers previously to KU, but, uh, this one seems special to you. Well, and, and it was, and it still is Blair, but, uh, you know, we were changing football coaches. Uh, I got there for the second year of Godfrey. And uh, so that was an interim deal. And, and then basketball, imagine working with in one right after the other, which is like consecutively, uh, three Hall of Fame basketball coaches, Naismith Hall of Fame, not just some, you know, run next door Hall of Fame. Uh, think of think of Larry Brown and, and then what Roy became. And now the current occupant of the office bill self is just mind boggling what we've all been able to witness and enjoy and, and report. And listen, with football, you've 
you know, if you, if you put Kansas football success on the graph, there'd be a couple of nice rises, but mostly yes. down below the average level is where it right. would be mostly. Um, uh, and, uh, but I, I know you finally recall uh, the, you know, the orange bowl team, the, the bowl teams. Oh. I, I, the, I remember the Aloha bowl team was, uh, was, was a fantastic team and a great trip and a kind of a breakthrough team for, for Kansas way back in the day. Uh, one of the stories I enjoyed reading was your recollection of, of uh, Glenn Mason. He had uh, taken the team to the Aloha Bowl, the first bowl game in quite a while, and right. um, and had taken the job at Georgia and was going to coach Kansas through the through the Aloha <laughs> Bowl. <laughs> it was a big day. He told yeah. me after we did our pregame show, he said, "Davis, you're never going to forget this day." And I thought, "What's he talking about?" Well, I, I haven't forgotten it yet. And I've forgotten a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he was the head coach of Georgia for a matter of hours. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Blair Mason. Blair Mason was such a good person to cover, wasn't he? I mean, gregarious, accessible. Uh, he he really um, he was really an interesting person to to cover, and that's what I found working in the athletic department. Um, he was always good for a quote. Uh, never mind zinging the media once in a while. I know Bob. He kept everybody on toes uh, at, at KU. A big personality guy. Um, you know, New Jersey guy who. Um, who, who was on the what, Woody Hay staff uh, at, at Ohio oh. State, and uh, listen, help, help came came to Kansas and, and really did turn around the fortunes of, of KU football, and uh, and has done a great job at the Big Ten Network o over the years now. So, um, <laughs> so Bob, let's let's go back to the beginning, and uh, and, and you growing up in, in in small town Kansas, but in, in an area that loved baseball. And, uh, and, and was very, very active in minor league baseball in the summer. And um, uh, I, I know you, you were in the, uh, in the area that produced Mickey Mantle. I'm not sure you got to see him play as a kid. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But did you see Mickey play? I saw him play. I really don't have a memory of him playing. My favorite player at Independence was the next year when Bill Verdon came. Oh, and he wow. He was a center fielder, and he was an outstanding player. My dad said he was the only outfielder he'd seen that level who on the crack of the bat could turn and run to a spot in the outfield, turn around and make the catch. And I've had a chance to talk to Bill a few times since then. And he has great memories. He still lives in the Springfield area and uh, had a great time in the KOM league as did several others. But Mickey Mantle was only 17 when he played for the independent Yankees. He was there one year, then he went to Joplin, hit about 900 and then he got promoted to the Yankees up from class C to, to the New York Yankees. And they made him play right field because a guy named DiMaggio was playing in center and they almost collided one time. And that's where Mickey's injuries kind of started. Yeah. Uh, good. People who saw him play before the injury said he was the, the greatest ball player he'd ever, they'd ever seen the speed yeah. and, the, and the, the combination of speed and power was just remarkable. So, right. Um, uh, so I, I just, I gathered by reading that, uh, that's, you know, we're time and place, right? Where you were. And then the, that in the combination of your dad's occupation at the time uh, really helped build the foundation for your interest in sports. Oh, absolutely. Plus it was the radio generation that I was part of. And, you know, we, I listened to games on the radio for years and we had the, uh, the mutual game of the day, major league baseball with Al Helfer. And it, it was just a fabulous time to, listen to ball games. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I listened and I, I loved it. And then the A's came to Kansas City and next thing you knew we had Major League Baseball. And I had been, to, I used to tell guys in the media, I was the only guy, uh, there were maybe a couple of exceptions who had actually seen the Kansas City Blues play. You know, Joe did, McGuff and, and a couple of others, but uh, that was a great era and I was kind of in at the grassroots not knowing what I was doing or hearing, but I was I, looking back on it. It was, uh, it was fabulous. And, and your dad was a, a sports writer. He's a sports editor, editor. one man staff at uh, independence daily reporter, independence, Kansas. And uh, uh, he enjoyed that immensely, but later got into the insurance business and left the media. But uh, I know he enjoyed his time with you know, a lot of 18, 19, 20 hour days, but uh, 
it was it was an afternoon paper, so the pressure wasn't there, maybe. But uh, <laughs> you know, he really enjoyed that. But when I got into the media, uh, he went with me a couple of times. My one of my first football games was the Fort Hayes football game at Omaha. They were in the same conference at the time, and I did the ball game, wrapped it up, great game. I looked at Dad on the air and said, "Well." I was kind of summarized the ball game and, and said the score and wrapped it up. You know, when the writers are getting ready to go to work, we're kind of going like this, you know, oh, that's done. But uh, it was great. Uh, I, I asked dad, how, how was that? And he said, well, I think it was okay. And he kind of chagrin, smile, said, I guess this is okay for you. I didn't know if that was a compliment or, or deep sadness. <laughs> but he had was resigned to the fact that one way or the other, I was going to be a broadcaster. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. And that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. remember talking to Eddie Sutton once and mm-hmm. Eddie told me that when he was a boy in, in Buckland, Kansas, that right. um, he would listen in, in the wintertime to college basketball on the radio, on the family radio. And he would sure. listen, spin the dial and, and listen to games uh, from Kansas, Kansas State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Wichita State. And, um, and I wondered if you had this, a similar experience listening to college hoops in the, uh, as a youth. Oh, yeah. We moved to Topeka. Actually, we moved to Manhattan first for a couple of years. Then Dad's job transferred him to Topeka. But uh, it was great with KU, K-State. Growing up in in southeast Kansas, I really wasn't much aware of the Big Seven at that time. But I became aware of it and listened to the guys we had here in Kansas and thought, you know, this is is really a fun idea. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to try to figure out a way to get into this racket. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, you know, we had good announcers in Kansas. So, of course, Max did, Max Falkenstein did <laughs> KU and K-State for many years on WREN in Topeka. <laughs> Dev Nelson at K-State was an early hero of mine. There were a lot of good guys in Kansas. Rick Weaver was in Wichita, and he later went to Miami and did the Dolphins for many years. But we had a lot of character announcers, and it was the radio era. The TV really hadn't kicked in at that point where you had the, you know, a game once a week, we had them on radio and, and I had my ear up against the speaker listening to every word and thinking, wow, I like this. And it might be something you want to do as opposed to say law school. Well, I did go to law school for a year. I was uh, not, I would say I was not a decorated law student, but uh <laughs> I did enjoy it. A lot of the guys I went to law school with have become judges and other things like that. But uh, it, it was just spectacular. I, I had a cousin who was in broadcasting at the time and worked in Topeka for a period of time. And uh, he was a top 40 disc jockey, which was mm-hmm. uh, another era, another way to go into broadcasting. But he told me when I told him I wanted to be a sports broadcaster, he said, I think you're climbing on a dead horse. I thought that didn't sound like a very good analogy. Dead horses aren't worth much, but that's how it all started. And and I'm so fortunate to stumble, literally stumble into a place like KYS Radio and Television in Hayes with one of the great all-time Kansas owner operators in broadcasting, Bob Schmidt. Yeah, right. And listen, yeah, that wasn't uh, that wasn't automatic for you. You went to uh, broadcast after law school, after a year at Washburn, you, you went to uh, what is a broad what was a broadcasting school in Kansas City. Right. Uh, right. On the building that's on the plaza. And 
And you were just like everybody else who just finished school. You were a little anxious about that first job. Who was going to hire oh, yeah. you? You didn't have experience and nobody seemed to be hiring people without experience. Yeah. In fact, my to be boss told me had he been, he was out of town when I was hired. He said, we had a policy against hiring people for full-time jobs without experience. And they had a, a good operation. That was one of the reasons. So, and I, I kind of was in the right spot at the right time. We had a really good radio uh, news director and sports director, the same guy, a fellow by the name of Keith Cummings, who mo later moved to Michigan and worked in Lansing. But uh, he, uh, he moved right at election time that year. And our assistant news director and I did most of the election coverage. So that's what you call being thrown into the, into the uh, fire. Uh, I, you know, we, we had, it was 1968 and uh, it was a presidential election. Nixon and Humphrey and, and a lot, Bob Dole ran for the Senate for the first time, a lot of great things going on, working at a TV station, those guys all came through. Now, I don't think Nixon and Humphrey did, but the other guys did. So I got right on that cutting edge. You know, I thought, you know, this is fantastic. This is happening right now. And I really, really enjoyed it. I, I didn't stay in the political aspect, but it was the excitement of the race and, and the live coverage. And it, it kind of appealed to me. Well, you couldn't stay in it because there was American League, American Legion baseball to cover. There and Hayes had yearly contenders for the state championship. They won some state titles, and uh, I went to the seven state regional, uh, which usually was in Nebraska. But uh, American Legion baseball, you have not really experienced doing sports at the grassroots level until you've done small town baseball on the radio. You have a, a roster and everybody's name and you know how to pronounce it, you're way ahead of the game. And, and if you're lucky, you've got a press box, but if not, you're at a table behind right. a fence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you writers don't have to pronounce the names right, but people on the radio kind of like to have their name pronounced correctly, I learned, but uh, that, that was a great way to get into it and see if you could survive. <laughs> I'll tell you what I loved your uh, I loved your schedule when you were when you're in the early years at at uh, K A Y uh, Y S. Uh, if, if I see if I have this right, uh, at noon you, you're part of a TV show. Uh, mm -hmm. One to four, you did a, 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 a DJ job. Uh, Three hours of wonderful music. <laughs> Occasionally, a polka found its way onto the air. <laughs> at six p.m., you were the camera operator. Uh huh? You had to be and versatile. And at 10, you're, you did the sports for the news at night. So right. that, that's a day. Um, I was looking for full-time work. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I, I, don't know if, uh, I, I don't know if the kids coming out of school today could relate to no. the, uh, the, the noon to midnight shift uh, at, uh, in media. But that's what it took. I mean, right? That's... We used to say the hours aren't good, but there's lots of them. I'm sure the pay more than made up for it. So $400 a month was my starting salary, <laughs> but that went up. I got, I, I rose to four and a quarter before you could hardly turn around because <laughs> they had underestimated my ability. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Bowling was a little six year old at that time, <laughs> listening and watching. And so that was the audience to which I played. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, listen, for uh, for a first job, you, you must have enjoyed the the area because you you were there long oh, enough. I was there 16 years, met Linda there. Stephen was born there. So, yeah, a lot of things you, you have to be, if not good, at least acceptable. But uh, it was a great place. Great first job, great ownership. You know, and Kansas Broadcasting has always had talented people. And Bob Schmidt was an example of that. But uh, it was a great place to work and great community. You know, look, at, they produced Jeff Bowling at, at Hayes. So there's just exhibit A. Say, say no more. Um, yeah, say no more, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, did, uh, how did the Kansas job come about? Uh, Monty Johnson, I believe, was the athletic director at the time. Yeah, Monty was, well, and they, they had sold the rights 
to an, another entity rather than keeping them in house. And at that time it was Learfield Communications. And I had done some work for Learfield. Uh, John Rooney was a really good friend. John was doing Pittsburgh State at the time and I was at Fort Hayes and John was getting more involved with Missouri and he was going to miss about 12 basketball games that first year. And he asked me if I could fill in for him. And as it turned out, I did and enjoyed it immensely. And then the Learfield became the rights over for Kansas and things were just popping all over. You know, it was so much fun. And Missouri's network was fabulous. He had 50 stations, including KMOX. So uh, that was big, really big. Heck yeah. Yeah, heck it, sure it was. Um, so you get to Kansas, as we, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Mike Gottfried was the football coach, but Larry Brown had just become the basketball coach. Right. Uh, were your first, same first year, you and Larry? Right. Okay. And, uh, and so over the next couple of years. Actually, it was my, I, let me back up. I was there Larry's second year. Okay. Okay. So that's really when I started working with him. That's about that's about the time the uh, the other coaching characters started showing up on the staff. Um, <laughs> John Calipari and Greg Popovich. Yeah. And Whatever happened to those guys? Right. What? <laughs> Bill Self. They became superstars. <laughs> it's kind of amazing, isn't it? The, the, the just the five years that uh, that Larry coached at KU, the 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 coaching talent that came through Lawrence at that time. The coaching tree of Larry Brown. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I've always said, I think you agree with me on this. Larry was a basketball savant. You know, he remembered the inbounds play they used for the Kentucky Colonels against the Carolina, you know, back in the American Basketball League. And he remembered all that. Uh, I've heard people say Larry would talk to a wino if he thought he had the perfect inbounds play. <laughs> uh, uh, I liked his comment in the book that, uh, that, that you made him feel comfortable on the coaches show, you know, that listen, all the coaches are, you know, that it's akin to pulling teeth for a lot of them. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. having, and uh, uh, so what, what were, what were some of the secrets of just uh, making a coach feel comfortable on a, on a TV set like that? Well, in the case of Larry, I was, I wouldn't want to say I was in awe of him, but he was a national celebrity. He came here and the next thing you knew, there was a feature story in sports illustrated about Larry Brown and, he was going to do a lot of great things in basketball and has He's had a great career. Last I heard he was still working, you know, <laughs> he, he, he's a great uh, guy to follow around. He's, he's a little different, but when that game's going on, Max and I used to say, he knows how much popcorn the guy in section G has had tonight. He had that much of an insight, what was going on in the court and in the building. No, he, he was, he was amazing. Wherever he went, it, it, it was amazing. I always thought yeah. that Larry, I, I don't know if he got bored, but he just always seemed to need another challenge. Uh, well, he, Max always said the two be best jobs in the world, the one he just had and the one he was looking at next, you know, whether it was UCLA or a pro job or whatever, but uh, he always kind of looked over in that other court. And, oh, that looks pretty good. You know, <laughs> But Larry was there five years and probably, you know, changed the course of Mighty Rivers like Superman did. Uh, but, he, but he really got things going in the waning days of the Ted Owens era. You know, it's hard to imagine now, but Alan Fieldhouse played to a lot of empty seats in those days. And uh, that was kind of a turning point, although Ted had some some really good teams. But Larry Brown was was a was a turning point. KU basketball. And now when you look back on it, it's kind of amazing that the unknown coaching candidate in, in Roy Williams not only took the baton, but, but went just as fast um, as Larry right. did. And, you know, had, had KU in the national championship game in his third year and, and his fifth hmm. year and just did an incredible job for a, you know, a, a coach who had never, no head coaching experience uh, at, at the college hmm. level and, it just goes to show with the, the, the power of a Dean Smith recommendation oh my. and, and the acumen of a Bob Frederick who, you know, who would you know, listen to a Dean Smith and it really took a chance on Roy. Oh, sure. Absolutely. But it worked out, you know, Roy did. Did a tremendous job. I don't know if people will ever realize the job he did and, and to follow Larry Brown as he did 
go to Final Fours, win Big Eight championships. Uh, great era, fun times. And uh, the KU tie between Carolina and, and Kansas, is, it's not as what it was at one time, but it's still strong. And, uh, you know, with Roy down there now, and I don't know if we'll be playing in Chapel Hill anytime soon, but uh, we'll see. Right, right. Um, and then he took the baton and handed it to Bill Self. And I can't imagine a, a, a better hire that Kansas could have made in, in 2003 um, by technically interim athletic director Drew Jennings. But uh, uh, right. they, they, they go out and, and, and Bill is, uh, Bill's the next guy and Kansas doesn't miss a step in the, in, in the succession of basketball coaches. Remember, he was going to take the North Carolina job, and it was the biggest story in the state for two weeks, at least. Yep. And then at the last of the two-week period, he says, I'm staying. And a little startled at what had come out of his mouth, but uh, it worked. You know, enter Roy Williams, North Carolina, but uh, Larry Brown, Roy Williams, Whoever, um, it, I guess it was supposed to be that way. And we had so many fun times and, and, and excitement and uh, wish we could do that in football. I know what you mean. I, I know Kansas fans know what you mean there with the looking for the, for the perfect hire. Maybe, uh, yeah, if, there maybe is one. if there is one, maybe he's there. Uh, maybe less miles needs some more time, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to see about that. But, um, Bob, it's, uh, it was an incredible run. Did I read the stats right? Almost, uh, listen, hey, we can't get this far into it and not talk about uh, 13 years with the Royals. And that must have been, for a guy who grew up a baseball fan and right. sort of the, the sport that pulled you in, uh, mm -hmm. to, to get the opportunity to broadcast the Royals games. Uh, it wasn't the, 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 the championship years of 14 and 15, but no. the, you, saw, you saw the build up to it. You bet. And Paul Spiroff became a very close friend and I miss him every day because he was so much fun to be around and work with. And that's the other thing about the broadcast business. You work with other people and you have partners and, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's to me a very exciting profession and I can't spell, but that was before spell check. So maybe I could have gone the other direction. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Bob, it's been great talking to you. Let's, uh, hey, Jeff, why don't you take this opportunity to tell us how they can get uh, The Dream is Real? Sure. Well, uh, Amazon.com, uh, especially during this time of the pandemic, seems to be a very popular way. Uh, so you can order it on, online there. Um, there are 16 Dillon stores in uh, Kansas, including the four in Lawrence, four in Topeka, Wichita, uh, Derby, Andover, uh, Hutchison, and then also in Salina and Hayes. And so they're available there and we'll have them in some retail outlets in Kansas city here mid mid January. I know Raleigh house is looking at stocking some. And so it is, it is available. We do plan some book signings uh, later on, uh, you know, when things settle down a little. Um, so that's, those are the best ways to, to get the book. Very good. And it's, again, it's called the dream is real. My life on the airwaves by Bob Davis as told to Jeff Bolig. Bob, thanks for spending so much time with us today. And, uh, and Jeff, thank you very much. Thanks, Blair. Okay, Blair. Jeff Bolig made it work. <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our production staff and everyone who helps make Sports Beat KC happen. Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. Hey, we have another deal for you, especially for those who want to deep dive into the Stars' terrific Chiefs coverage. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. How do you get it? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? I know I do. Check out the entire Kansas City Star product sports news features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented compadres, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.com. 
kansascity.com slash subscribe. If you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, send me an email at bkirkoff at kcstar.com and I'll get you to the right place. So whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports Beat KC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Wednesday with another episode.